Hello and welcome to another A-Level Forensic Psychology video. This is lesson three and we are going to be looking at the atavistic form. So the atavistic form is an early biological explanation of offending that was first put forward by Cesar Lombroso, who you can see on the screen now. By today's standards, many of Lombroso's methods and conclusions would be regarded as just ridiculous. However, he was one of the first researchers to pioneer a more scientific basis for the study of crime. In 1876, Lombroso wrote a book called Luomo Delicente, which effectively translates as The Criminal Man. And in that book, he suggests that criminals are actually genetic throwbacks, effectively saying that there are genetic subspecies who are primitive and didn't quite catch the evolutionary curve. Importantly, the big suggestion that he makes is that criminals are biologically different from non-criminals. So in the eyes of Lombroso, criminals were seen as lacking evolutionary development. He suggested that they have a savage and an untamed nature, which results in them finding it next to impossible to adjust to the demands of everyday civilised society. And as a result of not being able to adjust, they would then inevitably turn to crime, almost because crime is something that is as primitive as they are. So effectively, it matches their nature. So therefore, Lombroso saw offending behaviour as a natural tendency that is rooted in genes. So the idea that offending behaviour is innate and therefore an offender was technically not to blame for his or her actions was a brand new and revolutionary perspective at the time because up until then crime had been seen to be something that was more a moral kind of an issue. People who committed crimes were technically immoral um, rather than it being in somebody's nature. So it marked a very important turning point in how people saw crime and how people attempted to explain crime. And we'll have a little bit of a closer look at that in one of our evaluation points. Now Lombroso argued that offenders could effectively be identified via particular physiological markers that were linked to particular types of offences. And these markers are biologically determined atavistic characteristics, which are mainly features of the face and head, but not exclusively. And it's these markers that make offenders physically different from the rest of us. So examples of atavistic features include the bullet-pointed list that you can see on the screen now. As you can see, they're all features that involve the face and head. However, aside from those traits, Lombroso also said that characteristics could include dark skin, extra toes, nipples, or fingers. And he also said that it could include an insensitivity to pain, the use of slang when talking, having tattoos, and being unemployed. Lombroso also then went further and said that Particular types of offenders have specific physical and facial characteristics. So, for example, murderers, sexual deviants, and fraudsters would all possess different facial characteristics that meant you could determine what type of criminal somebody was just by looking at them. So, for example, murderers would have bloodshot eyes, curly hair, and long ears, whereas fraudsters are more likely to have thin, reedy lips. Okay, and you can see a little bit of an excerpt from his book, although the one that's on the screen now is a French translation of the book, but you can see the different types of criminals that he would talk about. My French is a little bit rusty, but I can see there that we have a thief um, in the top left corner, and there is a poisoner in there as well in the bottom right corner, I believe, um, and there's an assassin, so you know, a killer in the middle. Um, so... There's a lot of different there's a lot of different things that he put in his book and a lot of different types of criminals with a lot of different facial features um, that he suggested that they would have. And that's just a little bit of an excerpt. In Lombroso's defense, as much as we now know his theory is 
complete garbage. He did study over 4,000 criminals in order to come up with the theory. So he actually studied 383 dead criminals and almost 4,000 living criminals. Um, and they were all studied in terms of their facial and cranial features. And from that research, he then concluded that there was an atavistic form and that these features were indicators of criminality. He even went a step further and he concluded that 40% of criminal acts were committed by people with atavistic characteristics. Again, by today's standards, the research probably wasn't the best, but for the time, it did mark a turning point, as we said earlier. Okay, so that is the atavistic form, everything that you need to know for an outline, and we'll have a little look a little bit later on as to what that could look like. There isn't really very much to say about the atavistic form. It is one of the shorter topics in the forensic psychology chapter, and so that means we can move straight on to our evaluation points. So our first evaluation point is a strength, uh, but then we're going to follow that up with a counterpoint as well. Now, one strength of Lombroso's research is that it changed the face of the study of crime. He is widely classed as the father of modern criminology because he shifted the emphasis of crime away from a moralistic discourse where people were seen as being wicked or weak-minded or weak-willed, and that's why they turned to crime. And he shifted that more towards a scientific realm and a little bit more of a credible realm at the time, which was, you know, that it's more of an evolutionary thing, more of a genetic thing, and that people aren't necessarily to blame for their criminal actions. He also tried to describe how particular types of people are more likely to commit crimes, which actually then brought about the beginning of offender profiling. So both of these things suggest that Lombroso actually made a major contribution to the science of criminology. However, equally, there is some question as to whether or not Lombroso's legacy is entirely positive, which was suggested by Delisi in 2012. Because whichever way you look at it, there are very racist undertones in Lombroso's work. Many of the features that Lombroso identified as being atavistic, for example curly hair or dark skin, are most likely to be found among people of African descent. So technically, if you think about it, he's basically suggesting that people of African descent are more likely to be criminals. And that is unfortunately a view that fitted in with the 19th century eugenics movement. And if you don't know what the eugenics movement is, it is effectively a movement that was about in the early 19th century that said that not everybody is born equal. Some people are considered genetically fit. They have desirable human traits such as intelligence and morality and civility. And these traits are genetic. Um, they then went on to say that only the people that have got these traits should be allowed to reproduce for the good of society, whereas the people who don't have these traits, the people who are considered to be genetically unfit, they should be prevented from reproducing, again, for the good of society. Now, the atavistic form could be considered as supporting the eugenics movement because Lombroso suggests that criminal behaviour is an inherited trait. And so if society ever wanted to reduce the amount of crime that occurs, and if that society subscribed to the eugenics movement, then it could result in policies being passed where whole groups of people could be prevented from reproducing for the good of society. Okay, so there is a very, very dark element to Lombroso's research, particularly if you think about it in that kind of light. Okay, so that suggests that Lombroso's work might actually be much more subjective than objective, and that it might be very heavily influenced by racial prejudices. Now, no surprises, there is, of course, contradictory evidence to Lombroso's work. Um, so there was research done by Goring in 1913, and he effectively set out to establish the same thing as Lombroso did, whether or not there are any physical or mental abnormalities among offenders. He compared 3,000 offenders and 3,000 non-offenders, and he found no evidence to support Lombroso's idea. Although he did suggest that 
criminals tend to have a lower level of intelligence than non-criminals, but that was the only thing that he put forward. Other than that, he completely discredited Lombroso's theory. So that challenges the idea that offenders can be physically distinguished from the rest of the population, and it therefore kind of suggests that they are unlikely to be a genetic subspecies. And then as a final evaluation point, Lombroso also failed to control important variables within his research. Now you could argue it's because of the time when he did his research, modern scientific controls weren't really a massive thing at the time, however it does obviously mean that there is going to be a lack of validity within his research. So for example there was no control group of non-offenders which means that he didn't really have anything to compare his findings to. That also has a knock-on effect to having less control over confounding variables as well. So, for example, there's research showing a link between crime and poverty and poor educational outcomes. And such a link would then explain why, for example, offenders were more likely to be unemployed at the time. But this is obviously something that he didn't control for, so confounding variables could have played a big role in his findings. So that suggests that Lombroso's research doesn't meet modern scientific standards, and therefore his results could lack validity. Okay? So, those are your three and a half, four evaluation points. We'll have a quick look on the next slide as to how we can put the atavistic form into a six mark outline, just so that you can see what it could look like, although this isn't the trickiest of topics, but it's still nice to be able to see it in 150 words or so. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So here it is, a brief outline. Uh, so nice little introductory sentence there, early biological explanation and so on and so on. Um, a quick thing about the theory, a quick kind of couple of sentences. Criminals are seen as a genetic subspecies, less developed, and then how that then results in crime. My third paragraph is then specifically about the atavistic characteristics. So I've gone for general examples, uh, sloping brow, strong jaw, and so on. But I have also made a point of using examples that don't just cover the face and head, um, so I've gone for insensitivity to pain and dark skin, simply because that ties in nicely to what I would use in an evaluation point. Um, I'd also then go on and talk a little bit about the fact that you've got particular types of offenders, again because it ties in nicely to an evaluation point where you can talk about him bringing about the birth of offender profiling. I then finish off with the study that underpinned the theory. Um, it's kind of up to you whether or not you want to do that. I left the study out at first, but then I realized my word count wasn't great because I went down to about 130 words, something like that. Um, but with the study, I'm at about 175, 180. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. Without the study, I'm a little bit under my ideal word count. But with the study, I'm a little bit over my ideal word count. So it's kind of up to you. Either use the study um, and just take it as it is with a slight over word count or use the study and see if you can cut down somewhere else or alternatively leave the study out completely and then maybe expand somewhere else. However just bear in mind that having the study is useful for your evaluation section because one of your evaluation points refers directly to the research that he conducted so it might be nice to keep it in. Okay so that is the end of the video. It was the first lesson in explaining where crime actually comes from and the next video is going to be on genetic and neural explanations and it should already be up on your screen there so you can have a look at it whenever you're ready to do so. Anyway I hope it's all made sense. Um, if you've got any questions please pop them in the comment section below and as always I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in the next one.